I try to make sure that I know interpretively exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and have a solid plan. So I run through a lot of things in my head, making, including like imagining the way I use the bow to get the phrases out the way I want to and all of that. What a difference a few weeks can make. That is the world's biggest understatement, probably. But I don't know what else to say. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. We're still here, and we're chatting today with Lizzie Burns. And to show you how much the world has changed in the past few weeks, we recorded this on February 25th, talking about everything that Lizzie's been up to, what's coming up in the future. I'm sure that a lot of that has changed change and welcome to the way I do this podcast I follow the you may have heard me say this before but the Oprah Winfrey slash Dr. Phil advice of getting ahead and staying ahead so you're usually hearing things that I put in the can about a month ago so I'm recording this right now and I'm probably going to tell you this for the next month or two uh, just so you can understand as the world changes so fast it is right now March 26th 2020, and I am locked down in my place in San Francisco, as you likely are where you are, trying not to read the news and obsessively go down coronavirus spirals. So, will we talk about the coronavirus on this podcast? Yes, we will, of course. Uh, we did with Renan Meyer, and we talk about what's going on in people's lives, and this is going to have a major impact. But I also have all this content in the can that happened before all of this took place. So I invite you to step back and enjoy the way the world was in late February with Lizzie, who I am such a fan of her and what she's doing. She has spent a lot of time in the chamber music world, chamber orchestra world, which I find totally fascinating. We talk about how she got inspired by Don Palma to head down this path, advice for people looking to explore a career in chamber music, and a whole lot more. I had such a great time chatting with her. And we're going to hear a little bit of Lizzie playing some Rosenmuller with Ensemble Connect. I also want to say thank you to all these folks that have supported the podcast over the years. Most significantly, you, the listener. Thank you so much. 13 years and counting. And also to all these great companies, large and small, that are going through tough times too. So just thank you to Upton Bass, to Dario Strings, the Bass Violin Shop, Steve Swan String Bass, Colstein Music, A440 Violin Shop, and Modacity. And if you want to help out the music community, the bass community, go ahead and click on through to their websites. We've got those all linked up in the show notes. And if you need to buy some strings or you're thinking about ordering a bass or any sort of accessories, I'm sure that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, here we go with our conversation with Lizzie Burns. Now you were on the road, weren't you? Have you been? Were you uh, on tour a little bit earlier this month? Yeah, I just got back about a week ago. Uh, uh, I had a week at home, and then I just at the last minute had to come back up to Boston yesterday. So I'm back up here for a couple of days. Okay. Uh, but yeah. What that I, that group of Far Cry? That seems like a that's who you were on tour with, right? It was, yeah. Yeah, that seems like a really cool group. Have you have you played with them uh, regularly or off and on or how is how's that all worked? Yeah, I've been um, a guest with them for about four years. They had two full time bass players, and one of them left, I think, two okay. seasons ago. So I've been playing with them more these last two years. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that seems like a really interesting, interesting uh, gig. Were you bringing your own bass? I think I saw you looking for a travel trunk or something a, a few weeks ago. So I'm curious. Yeah, I recently have a removable neck system on my bass. So I brought my bass and had my first foray of taking it apart and putting it back together and all that. Oh, wow. What was that like? Uh, you know, nerve wracking at first, but it's really not that bad. And then it's nice because you have your own base on the road, which is pretty rare. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's such it, there. You know, there's there's some pieces I I work up for different things, and I think okay, this is ready, but only on my base. Like I would not attempt this on some borrowed base with all those variables. Totally. Yeah, and it, well, it's, it's funny because like I, I live in San Francisco, and I remember a couple of years ago uh, Rufus Reed coming out with, and he has a removable neck trunk, and it was uh, you know system and trunk, and and it was great you used to see all the kids like crowd around Rufus and watch in awe as he was putting everything together but it i mean it, it's certainly more work than just taking the base out of the case but it, it must be so much easier to move it around with that reduced size it is yeah i mean and it's less intimidating for the people that have to handle it at the airport so they're much friendlier about having to take it and inspecting it and all that as well so yeah you have to take it apart you have to put it back together it only takes about 10 minutes to do either of those things um, but then you just leave it put together while you're on the road. It's just for the flights. So it's really not that bad. So what do you do? So do you bring a soft case then too? Uh, yeah. Or, okay. Okay. Yeah, you do pack you... the body in a soft case, which goes in the trunk. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, cool. There's this bass player named Marcos Machado who's, who's come up with kind of an interesting hack, but I don't think it would work for most bassists. Uh, he has a really small bass, um, and he actually packs it in the flight case, but then he packs a soft case over the flight case, which seems counterintuitive, but apparently he, he says people, when they see that soft case, they tend to not – he, he, his theory, which may or may not be true, is that it, uh, it makes people a little more careful careful handling it because they think it might be something fragile uh, rather than having a hard shell. <laughs> right. Right. But that's a yeah. whole, whole different level of complexity. And then your soft case is going to get tor destroyed and, and it wouldn't work probably for, for most people. I think it's just that he's got this extremely small base. I have a very small base too, but the, at least the hard cases, the removable neck cases that I've used are still pretty big. I don't know yeah. if I could put a soft case around it, but yeah, I know. So, um, you, I, I, you've got, I'm, I'm just sort of interested by, it seems like you've got all sorts of cool, um, it's, you know, you, you're like me, you're, you seem to be like pretty in the classical sphere mostly anyway. Is that pretty much what you do playing wise? Most of the time, yeah. yeah. There's some exceptions, but that's you know what I'm trained to do and what I do most of the time. Yeah, but it's it's I love the 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 variety of uh, I guess chamber projects or or maybe less traditional projects. And um, I don't. Did you do, what you're doing right now? And I know you've got a lot of career ahead of you, but like, are you doing right now what you thought you'd be doing? Like, if you go back to uh, your time studying with Ed Barker. I mean, are, is this kind of the path you projected for yourself? Yeah, it is actually. Wow. Um, I always wanted to move to New York and I studied with Don Palma at NEC yeah. before I, I studied with Ed Barker and he was kind of like New York's bass player for a while back in like the seventies and eighties. And mm -hmm. he had all these pieces written for him and he had would played with Orpheus and all these fantastic groups. And I always really admired that. Um, and I like playing small ensemble repertoire, which is kind of a make your own career path kind of thing. So I always thought I would move to New York and see what happened and make it work. And fortunately, I got into a very great program at Carnegie Hall, which kind of enabled me to start my career there. Um, yeah. What is that yeah. program that that is? I, I was I was looking that up today, um, but I've lost it in my notes. Uh, what, what? Tell me about that program again. It's called Ensemble Connect. Okay. So okay. it's a two-year fellowship program, um, and there's about five components to it, I think. Performance, obviously. There's a chamber music concerts at Carnegie Hall and Juilliard. There are concert series at both places. And then there's a school component. So we're each paired with a New York City public school music teacher, and we go to that school 25 times per year. So it's about three times a month you go and you're a teaching artist. So the idea is that the classroom teacher is the teaching expert and you are the expert musician and together with your powers combined, you can do more in the classroom for the kids, which is a really rewarding experience. The other components include weekly workshops, professional development, um, like entrepreneurship training and stuff like that. And then uh, community performances, we go into like prisons, homes for, homeless youth, et cetera, uh, and put wow. together interactive concerts that aren't necessarily just like 
I love classical music, so I'm going to play this for you right now because I think it's cool. We really explore how to make the music and the experience relevant for them and how to make it so that they can participate and not just learn something, but really like, I don't know, experience the music the same way we love it. Wow. What a cool program. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Wow. And, and that's through Carnegie Hall. It is. Yeah. Okay. Two year, two year fellowship doing that. Wow. That's super interesting. Um, was, was that what you expected getting into it? I mean, I, I did a tiny, like I, I did way back in the day, the civic orchestra of Chicago, and we had this teeny tiny, uh, community outreach component, which I found totally interesting. I remember going into Malcolm X community college and going into some of the public schools. Um, but it sounds like this is, uh, significantly more fleshed out than, than what I did. Was it, what, what is it, what you expected? Um, I didn't really know what to expect when I went into it. I knew that that was a huge component of the the ensemble and the program, but I didn't really know what it looked like. Like you, I had done a little bit of what at that time you called outreach. Now that I think the buzzword is community engagement. Yeah. Um, so, but the way that they do it is just light years beyond anything that I had ever experienced. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount it's really interesting because we all, I mean, it's a very competitive program. There's like over 500 applicants every year and 18 people, usually one bass player gets in. So it was, I don't know, you have to be like at the top of your performing game. So we're all experts at our instrument. And then we go in and we're brand new learners at this community engagement stuff. So yeah, it really blew my mind at first. It was really difficult to learn all the skill, but you really get used to it over time. That's super. So what was the, what was the audition and application process like for that? Did you have to play like a, what you think of like a traditional audition and do some interviews or how would that, congratulations, by the way, on getting selected. Oh, that's, thanks. that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big audition. Um, it was something I knew I really wanted and I was, I was definitely prepared. I played my best that day. Um, but yeah, there was a tape round. Um, I don't know how many bass players applied, but I think eight or nine of us were invited to the live round and then, we played our first round, which was mostly solos. Um, I don't think we had to play any Bach, but it was like romantic piece, classical piece. We had to play a couple of Bach excerpts, um, just the bass players. And then we had to bring our own chamber music group, which is kind of a pain to put together because I didn't <laughs> live in New York at the time. But oh, yeah. they've since changed that. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, so I played the fifth movement of the Prokofiev Quintet with a great group, which was probably the highlight of that round for me. Cool. And then... Uh, me and one other person were invited to stick around and we played a chamber music round where we read, I think it was Dvorak Quintet with some alumni from their program in front of the whole panel. So there's still like, you know, the panel is like, there was one bass player, I think it was Tim Cobb, but then you have, you know, a slew of chamber music gods in the world, you know, <laughs> so it was, it was a really big <laughs> panel and an intimidating day, but, but it was really fun. Once there was only two of us, I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, I know my strengths just go in. I played my best. And then there was an interview after that where they just kind of make sure you're not a jerk, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, do you get nervous for stuff like that? That's not like I'm getting nervous just <laughs> hearing you describe that. <laughs> um, yeah, there's definitely a nervous energy, but I, I think I'm past the point where I let it impact my playing. I'd certainly used to impact the way I would perform and I, I didn't always feel like I played my best, but the way I prepare now, I feel is kind of immune to that in intimidation. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> what, uh, what, what, uh, how do you prepare now? I, I I'm taking mostly notes. mentally. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't have to play that many auditions and it's certainly different than an orchestral audition, Yeah. but I try to make sure that I know interpretively exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and have a solid plan. So I run through a lot of things in my head, making, including like imagining the way I use the bow to get the phrases out the way I want to and all of that. Um, and you know, it doesn't work with stuff you've just started a month ago, but stuff you really know it's, I don't know. I can just kind of do it all in my head. And then I just have to stay mentally strong and know that I'm the only Lizzie Burns bass player out there. And the way I play is something I'm confident in and proud of. And if it's not for whoever's on the other side, 
that's totally fine. But if I play my best representing myself and playing the works the way I mean to, then that's the best I can do. Yeah, that's such a great that's such a great uh, takeaway. I remember talking to Joe Conyers about like when he I think when he won the spot in the in Philadelphia, kind of having that same a mindset, you know, like there's only, there's only one of me. There's I, I, you know, I'm bringing to the table what I've, what I've got. I'm curious about that, that uh, visualization sort of work. You know, I do, I'm, I'm preparing this week for, I'm doing like six talks <laughs> on various oh, things. Wow. It's like, wait, it's like, uh, and I've, you know, I, I, so it's way overwhelmed, but like, tr like mentally preparing, physically preparing, like when you're, when you're doing that kind of work, do you, do you like set aside a particular part of your day and you say, I'm going to do visualization? Is that, is that how you do it? Or is it like baked into your practice time or w when does that happen for you? I guess for me, it's usually separate. And before I practice, oh. um, I make sure it's in my head first. I get, I don't really sit there and plan it, but I usually do it over coffee, I guess. Yeah. Preferably somewhere where like, you know, my dog isn't going to come and like distract me or something <laughs> like that. And I can like sit outside and really visualize. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's a, uh, I think it's having very specific and simple a specific and simple picture of what you're trying to do for me that's helpful because if I try to do if I think about this note has to end like this and go into the next one it's a little bit too detailed but if I think like this is the arc of this phrase and this is the color I want to use in this part of the piece then it's very easy to focus on that one thing uh, I'm curious, like for that, do you, do you write anything down in terms of that? Because uh, I've, I've talked to some people who they have like a specific phrase they associate with a piece or a passage that helps like flow or some, or something more metaphorical or what, or, or slow bow. I mean, do you, do you write any of that uh, intentionality into the music, like physically into the music or? You know, I, I also have a lot of colleagues that are very um, word specific like that. Yeah. I don't generally... But by the time, like if I'm playing solo repertoire, I also am not looking at the music yeah. um, anyway. So it's more of an association. But yes, I don't know. Some people are, write more down. I'm also not somebody who writes a whole lot in my parts anyway. So Sure, sure. I hope you all are doing well during these unprecedented times. It's crazy for me. It's crazy, I'm sure, for you. And it's crazy for all these folks that have supported the podcast for all these years. And I just want to give a big thanks to all of them. I know that everybody is struggling in this time. But if you need an instrument or strings or any sort of accessories, it would be great if you checked out D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Colstein Music and the A440 Violin Shop. If you're looking for an app to practice, Modacity is a wonderful app. All of these people have been with me through thick and now through thin. So I just really want to thank them for all the support they've given over the years. We've got links to all of them in the show notes. Um, so th that so an Ensemble Connect is the name of the Carnegie Hall program, right? Yep. Okay, good. So, uh, the um, so at, so. Again, congratulations on, on having gotten that. That's that's super cool. And then the actual training for for that program, like like wh how what were some of what was the training for the community engagement portion like? Like, what were some? Did you have workshops? Did you work one on one with mentors? Did you observe other people? What what was that like? So generally, we put these um, these community engagement concerts together in small groups of four or five. So we had a team working on them. Um, and we there was specific language and training. And when they were introduced to us, they're called interactive performances that we put on. Hmm. Um, and there was like a guideline as to how to get you started, which was really helpful. Like you find an entry point. It could be texture and music or rhythm rhythm's a little bit too broad but or character and music you know something like that to really like hone in your point mm -hmm. um and then they walk you through some steps as to how to or options as to how to start building your program and come up with activities that relate to music you want to play that connect to your entry point um, but honestly going and watching one was the most helpful thing there's a an ensemble called dakota which is made up of ensemble connect alumni and they are 
experts at this. You know, they do it all the time and they're very, very good. You're on, they're on the other side of the program and really employing this work in the world in a big way. Um, so they did one that we went and saw, which was enormously helpful because then you see how they interact. This one was in a public school. So we saw how they interacted with the kids, what kind of worked and what didn't, and how they were able to bounce back if something didn't work or pivot to get something to work a little bit better. Um, and then it's a lot of trial and error. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I'm sure. So, and D Dakota is the name of that group? Yeah. Oh, cool. D-E-C-O-D-A. Oh, that's, I like that name. That's a cool name. I will look them up for sure. Yeah, figuring out what works, especially in like a public school setting. I'm always fascinated by people who really are able to, um, well, deliver to any audience, but especially that audience. Like, what did they do that, that seemed to connect with the kids you were observing? Hmm. Those are elementary school kids. Okay. Yep. So them, you just have to be moving around all the time. Uh, like okay. You can't stay on one point too long. Um, you ask for an answer and then get through it very quickly and then move on to the next thing and just kind of be excited. And it's all about just like constantly doing something to make them excited and have fun. Yeah. High schoolers, it's more like, at least for me, my approach was always like make them think you're cool. Because then they won't be like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're lame, you know. <laughs> so relate to them on that way. Middle schoolers, though, I got nothing. They're impossible. They're, they're so uh, awkward and, like, afraid of embarrassing themselves. It's really hard to get volunteers in a middle school. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I hear you. I, that, that, I go into my local middle school, and that, that's, like, the age I'm the least – comfortable working with. I've been doing it for years too. You'd think I get better at it, but, but no, oh, I'm sure you have. <laughs> well, maybe marginally, but, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, wow. That's, uh, so, uh, are, so what, um, and I, I, these are totally unscripted. I'm just, I'm like, just ideas popping into my head. Like what, what suite of activities are you up to these days? So you've been playing with a far cry, you're living in New York, um, but still doing some work in Boston. Like what's, I, I don't know, what are the neck, what have you been up to? Like even the last six months or so, what are some of those um, projects that you're, that you're involved with? Um, well, I can give you the last, the last month has been interesting. I had a, this tour with the far cry and then I came back last week and was playing in a jazz club every night with John Batiste. Really? The pianist in the late show. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, that was a random gig, but that was pretty fun. Um, today I'm working with a hip hop artist and a DJ working on a, like a strings and hip hop collaboration. Um, that's coming up in a few months, just workshopping some stuff. Um, before that, I was playing a musical theater show that is probably Broadway bound at some point. Um, so I dabble in that world a little bit too. Uh, yeah, it's, there's a, just a lot going on. It's funny because like New York is the place of opportunity. You know, there's so much going on. There's tons of musicians. There's tons of need for musicians. It's also a difficult place to live. Yes. It's very expensive. Um, it's very hectic. It's a very, uh, you know, high stress, go work all the time environment. Um, so you have a little bit of both worlds. Like you have to work to be able to afford to live there. And there is a lot of work to be had. There's a lot of opportunity, but it's still a hustle. You know, it's kind of a, some things you do because they're awesome. And then some things you do because you got to do them, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Ups and downs of freelancing. <laughs> for, for sure. Um, do, does, um, a part of me wants to just go live in the woods and, and have peace. But part of me also kind of loves that hustle lifestyle. And it's funny moving out here to San Francisco, which when I first moved here, I thought this is the most mellow place compared to other big cities I've lived in. Now it feels hectic to me, which I think just means I'm kind of turning into a soft West coaster, <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> but like, and I love New York and I love visit. Do you, do you, do you thrive on that energy that, that, um, you know, uh, the, just that, what, that special energy musical and otherwise in New York city, is that, is that, uh, get you excited artistically or do, do you enjoy that lifestyle? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I also would answer. love to okay. live in a cabin in the woods. Um, I, I like New York. I grew up in the New York area, so, you know, yeah. I've been used to it my entire life. Um, and I used to really think that like big hustle Manhattan energy was cool. And sometimes it is, 
but I live in a pretty quiet part of Brooklyn, so mm-hmm. I have a little bit of both worlds. I live pretty far from Midtown. Um, but I just like working there because there's so much happening in every part of the field. Like I also do a bunch of recording for films. Um, like that stuff happens there. All of Broadway is there. The museums are there and they all have cool concert series and they're always trying to do interdisciplinary collaborations and through all these great ensembles, all the great concert halls. Um, plus it's just a hub. Like a lot of New Yorkers aren't in New York that much in the music scene. I mean, mm-hmm. um, because people from other cities that don't have big freelance scenes like this, just hire people from New York to come and play projects in whatever other cities. Yeah. So do you, um, well, I'm, cu- I'm curious, like the, I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of the, you know, the, that hustle, kind of kind of energy and then just trying to find some balance and get out. How do you, how do you unplug um, when you're, when you're not at work? I mean, and you live in a quiet part of Brooklyn, which is, which is great, but like, how do you, how do you balance that sort of, well, even just that musician lifestyle in general, which can be frenetic late nights, uh, scheduling chaos, not sure what's happening three months down the road. Like, how do you, um, what, how do you, like, I try to get out and spend time in nature and go for a run and get on vacation. What do you, what do you do to, um, just get, have some balance in your life? Yeah. I also try to leave the city as much as I can. Um, okay. Yeah. My fiance and I were both big outdoors people. So we'll, uh, we'll go for a hike or we'll go take a trip somewhere or, go camping if it's nice if it's the summer or something or we'll go down to the beach in new jersey which is a uh, near where i'm from and there's it's quiet and you can go down, go down there any time of year and it's still very nice uh, yeah i mean there's no perfect balance at least for me it's a uh, because it, like as you said it's a lot of nights and weekends um you just take it i just take it where i can get it you know yeah if i have a week like maybe it's a bummer that I don't have any work, but maybe I really needed that week and we can take a few days to go somewhere and kind of regroup and then come back and have a few days to practice and get ready for the next stuff. And you know, yeah. no, it's never consistent though. It's never like one week a month. I'm going to have this time to myself. It's pretty random. Yeah. I think that's just the piece that musicians have to make with like, like I can have balance on the macro level, you know, if I look out over, yeah. the, over the year or something, but there are periods that are deeply unpleasant in terms of busyness. Um, unpleasant might be the wrong word, but, but frenetic and then, and then try to balance that out. So, you know, I think that a lot of people listening, they did like everything you're doing. So you're playing, you know, work on hip hop projects and and playing with the pianist from the late show that it, I, th- I thought I saw that pop up on Facebook um, and and a far cry and all these other things like how. Can, can you just take me or us, I guess, on like, like go back to maybe high school and just how, how do you now find yourself doing all these things that you're doing? Just can, can you just kind of go through uh, getting into music school and going through that and the, eventually deciding to move to New York City? Um, that, that I think it'd be interesting to hear. Yeah, for sure. Um, I first want, knew I wanted to go to the New England Conservatory to study with Don Palma by, because I saw an Orpheus Chamber Orchestra concert in New York and that kind of uh, sent me on my way. I knew I loved his playing and I knew I wanted to study with him. Cool. So I went up there and I kind of just trusted him. He kind of pulled my playing apart for about a year and we rebuilt it from the ground up and I was an absolutely obsessive practicer i was practicing you know at least five hours a day for most of college and really kept my head down and did a lot of technique work and at a certain point i think i was more advanced technically than i was musically like i had musical instincts but i didn't really know how to project them like i didn't know how to like get my ideas out through the bass um and then i started playing more chamber music because at NEC it's like a very chamber music oriented community like on Friday nights you know we'd have parties but everyone would bring their instruments and 
it would be a sight reading party and chamber music party and all of this. So I was always surrounded by these incredible chamber musicians. And then I started playing more of it myself. And I started to find my voice a little bit. Like I started using my sound in a way that felt more personal. Um, and that kind of, I don't know, I fell in love with chamber music. And at NEC, there's a chamber orchestra that has one bass in it. And I got into that my senior year, which kind of, let me put both those worlds together. Like I was obviously orchestrally trained. Um, so, you know, you have the money notes, as they say, when you yeah. play in first position on the lowest strings, you know, I had all that down and then was able to use like my chamber music sound and mindset in a somewhat orchestral setting, uh, which was really fun. And I learned how to play without a conductor in a big ensemble or medium ensemble. Um, and then I thought because I'm a bass player, I probably needed an orchestra job in order to make a living. So I went to BU for my master's and studied with Ed Barker, who's obviously an orchestral legend, but he's actually a legend of all types of music. He's a great soloist and chamber musician as well. Um, so I thought I was going to do that for a bit, but I wasn't that into taking auditions or practicing excerpts. And I kind of realized that, like, I was still developing my sense of self as a musician and that practicing excerpts wasn't going to help me learn what I was trying to learn in that moment. Um, and that's not to say this would be true for anybody else, but just for me, practicing excerpts wasn't, it wasn't doing it for me. I wasn't learning about the things I wanted to be learning about and I wasn't playing the way I wanted to play. Um, and Ed Barker is just a phenomenal teacher. He kind of, like what I was talking about, not knowing how to get my musical sensibilities like projected out to the audience through the bass. He took that and made it very apparent to me in my very first lesson. He said something like, I think I played the Bach Berets. And he said, like, why are you phrasing it like that? And I was like, I, I don't know. And he <laughs> said, it's, a, it's because you feel it that way, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I feel it that way. He was like, that's not enough. <laughs> so <laughs> we then spent the next, you know, two years really taking apart every little phrase. And he like got me to look at detail in such a specific way that like I wasn't even hearing at first. It took me six months to really figure out what he was doing, but he really just, has such an eye and an ear for detail and he was trying to develop that in me and all of his other students as well um, so I got much better at listening very very carefully especially to like how notes connect and then how you sculpt a phrase from there and that's how you make it really convincing often you you know you hear bass players were like I don't know it's just different than violin you're yeah. like wow bass is really hard they're <laughs> playing really well but you don't always get like a very clear sense of the musicality that they're trying to convey. Um, this is not universal, of course. It's mostly, you know, especially when you see a very good student, you're like, wow, they're very good. But like, they could be that much better. And that's that extra 10%, you know, in okay. those tiny little details. So we really worked on that for a long time. And uh, that really changed my playing in a big way, which was fantastic. Um, and then I started playing more and more chamber music in like the freelance world in Boston. And then I knew I wanted to take this Ensemble Connect audition and win it. So I worked my butt off for that and it worked out. Um, and then I was in New York and had all this chamber music at my fingertips. And yeah, I realized I didn't have to have an orchestra job. <laughs> there was plenty of work out there for people who play like I do and who have the musical priorities. Um, that come with a small ensemble, you know, way of playing music and mindset. So that's kind of what I've been doing since. I haven't taken any auditions. I've uh, just been kind of sticking to what works for me, what I love, what I'm best at. Um, and it's worked out in a funny way. You know, it's still stressful. It's freelancing. Like you said, sometimes you don't know what, what you're doing three months down the line, but there's plenty of need for music out there and especially in New York, there's plenty of opportunities to play. So 
I just want to thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're listening right now, you're a part of the community. Congratulations. And I want to thank the people that helped me put this together each and every week. Trevor Jones, Mitch Mooring, Krista Copper, Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy. They are such great people. Just thank you so much to all of you for putting this together and being on this journey with me. But thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. If you know someone who could use uh, cheering up, we're going to try to keep doing that here on the podcast. So feel free to forward this to a friend, share this via social media, forward it in an email, anything like that would be really appreciated. And just thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to this show. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting how sometimes when you just decide to maybe not focus on a certain thing like excerpts or focus on a certain thing like chamber music, how there even if you might think or you've been told or you'd be under the impression uh, that maybe there aren't, especially as a bass player, uh, how are you going to make it as a chamber player? But it's amazing to me um, how many people actually are having a thriving career as as a bass player doing something that you'd think of as chamber music, whether it's Lewis Levitt with Sybarite 5 or um, you know Renan Meyer and Time for Three or um, a lot of less prominent examples. I mean, there, there are so many people out there that are that are making it, making it uh, uh, a, a really fascinating career for themselves, not you know on what you think of as that orchestral orchestral path. Yeah, totally. I think a lot of that comes from the presence of chamber orchestras mm-hmm. right now. There's there's a lot of them, um, and then you have people like Lewis and Renan who have their small ensembles, a trio or a quintet, um, and they're, they're really amazing. That they've made that like their main career out of it. I know. Um, yeah, the but, chamber yeah. the chamber orchestra thing is so interesting to me. It's such a di- I I don't want to say that there's more person maybe the, like I I just saw the Australian chamber orchestra play a couple months ago, and you know all the upper string players are standing, and the just the the theatricality of it uh, of what they and and then also just, I don't I just felt such. Uh, compelling personality from that group. And I felt that way with other chamber orchestras. I play in a more traditional chamber orchestra down in Memphis, Tennessee called the Iris Orchestra. Um, But uh, other chamber, like it's it, that, uh, that uh, chamber ensemble or like small orchestra uh, energy, attitude, whatever that, I don't know. It's, it's just an, it's a, it's different than the, you know, a hundred person symphonic experience. Um, and I, it's hard for me to put my finger on exactly why those two have that difference in energy to me, but I really feel it. Yeah. I mean, it's basically like a string quartet on steroids. Yeah. Like you have to, especially as a section, you know, with bass, it's usually two bass players, but the violins is usually five firsts. Um, and they have to play with like as convincing uh, a sense of style and phrasing their part but with five of them and when you have five people's sounds generally with players that are very sensitive and invested in blend and uh, you know creating that kind of unique sound that only like those five people can get together i mean when you put that into the context of 18 or 20 string players it can be a pretty phenomenal sound yeah yeah. And, you know, something about um, you're t- talking about chamber players and, you know, like l- l- not, you know, the musicality that you hear like in violinists and cellists and that sort of thing. I, I played for 15 years in this um, chamber ensemble up in northern Wisconsin, a wonderful set of musicians, uh, in particular, the first violinist, David Perry, who's played with Orpheus over the years and a uh, wonderful teacher soloist and and i learned so much being the only bass player in that group and not thinking bass at all just thinking music and thinking string playing at a high level and it's just so interesting i don't know how my mentality changed um as i stopped playing so much eight person section playing and started doing more um where i was the only bassist i don't know i I think it it definitely Changed the way I thought of sound, tone production on the bass, just how I thought of the bass and the role of the bass. And I know that other people who play a lot of chamber music have kind of had that experience. Yeah, I mean, you even just saying that reminded me that I definitely take it for granted because I usually (laughs) am the only bass player or one of two. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it's a completely different thing. I actually, like playing in a bass section is relatively unfamiliar to me now. Um, And I always wonder about like am I sticking out too much you know do I need to play away from the bridge a little bit more when I'm playing in a section Um, but when I'm playing 
one bass, I play with my sound, you know, the same way a string quartet cellist is like, well, this is how I play. I don't need to use the same strings as the next guy or like matches both. You know, it's, it's just a different thing. You play with your personality. This is, you have that line of the score is your responsibility, not your and seven of your best friends. <laughs> so yeah. you really have to bring it and, and show the full capacity and your interpretation of what that role is, especially in the first rehearsal. Then, of course, you develop it with, in a very close context, with the other players who are responsible for their line of the score. Yeah, um, yeah it's a completely different way of using your sound. Generally, for me at least, it means playing a hell of a lot closer to the bridge um, and just getting your sound out in a very direct, focused way, rather than like having like a billowy orchestral sound, which would be a little bit too muddy in the context of a trap quintet, for example, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's really interesting to think of. And it's, it's something I think of a lot when I sit in a bass section these days and I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about like blending my pizzicata with seven other people or, and, you know, I notice I look down and I'm at the edge of the fingerboard, you know, more often than not, uh, which is such a yeah. contrast. Um, I'm curious about you. You were mentioning about when you're studying with Don, it's five hours a day or even more. Sometimes in the practice room, like what? Uh, I'm how is how has that changed for you in the years since then? What's what's your practicing like these days? And I know it's tough when you're on the road and you're doing different. I'm sure it's different, you know, week to week, day to day. But like, what what does practicing look like for you these days? Just in terms of time, what you work on, when you do it, any of the that nitty gritty. Yeah, um, it definitely depends, as you as you said. Um, mostly in what I, I mean, mostly I practice to learn the rep I need to be playing next week or whatever it is. Um, but I also try to keep up with, I just try to stay in shape all the time um, because so many times I've had things thrown at me and if I wasn't at the top of my physical shape, then I wouldn't have been able to execute them as quickly um, or as well in the concert. So I play scales when I can. It's not every single day. You know, there are some days when I don't have any time to practice. Um, but I try to play scales. I have a scale system that I learned from Ali Yazdanfar that I use. Um, that's very good for just like keeping my left hand facility over the entire instrument so like even if i'm not really playing any solo rip i still have my thumb position chops in shape you know mm -hmm. um and something i've been doing a lot more of that i think i slipped on for the first couple of years since i was out of school is i recently started using a practice journal again which has been very helpful in just um prioritizing and planning out my week a little bit better instead of being like oh i have a couple of hours i guess i'll practice it's like no like you didn't play your scales on the a string yesterday so oh. you got to do that today otherwise you're not going to have it you know so just keeping myself more accountable by writing stuff down has been helpful the last couple of days or the last couple of weeks uh, do you do you write i'm curious I, I, I i'm always fascinated by practice journals do you write down what you're going to do or what you did do or both or or anything else beyond uh i remember i used to keep a practice journal that was just like bullet points and then i got a little more flowery uh maybe you don't do that but um what do you do in terms of before after um i do both okay something okay. i learned about myself is that i used to try to I was like all or nothing, you know, it's very much in my personality. It's like I was practicing spiccato for three hours every day <laughs> when I was a freshman, you know, yeah. and I was really intense. Um, but I've learned about myself in my adult life that that doesn't always work for me. Like if I make an unrealistic goal for myself and I don't achieve it, then I just stop, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I, you have to do an hour of stroke in every day for a week. Like I'm, I don't have a life where I can do that anymore. So Right. Instead of trying that for three days, missing a day, and then never doing it again, I've been trying to build in a lot more flexibility for myself. So I plan what I'm going to do with the full knowledge that it's probably not going to happen exactly the way I thought it would, but it's a good outline for how I want to use my time. Often I don't get to everything I want to do, which is why writing down after just saying like, this, you got to a good place, you don't have to worry about it. This, you didn't get to, you have to do that tomorrow morning. That's really helpful. 
and then you know the cycle continues you know you don't get to everything the next day but you do your best and make sure that you are especially for me because i have i have deadlines first rehearsals come up every week and i have to make sure everything's ready for those first rehearsals every time so yeah just keeping track of it has been really helpful yeah, and there's something about uh, for me at least about also just writing it down. It kind of gets it out of my brain, and so then when it's practice time, I'm doing the practice thing, and I'm not like I, I don't perseverate on it as much. Uh, sometimes, totally. Just, yeah, it makes it more objective somehow. Yeah, and then like you can look at it. You know, you mm-hmm. don't have to remember it all and constantly be reminding yourself, which is distracting. Yeah, you just write it down. You do what you're focusing on, and then you look at everything else you have to do, and you prioritize the amount of time you have to try to get everything in as much as you can. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I have like an impossible question, but I, so I'm trying to find it in a way that's po- like, so, okay. What you're doing specifically might be very difficult to do outside of New York city, but let's say somebody out there is listening in Boise, Idaho, or, um, you know, Vancouver or where I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And they want to, they want to do more chamber music as a bass player. And again, this might be just a, an idiotic question, but like, what, what, what would be like some first steps for somebody like they they don't, they've, they've barely, they've maybe played trout quintet once in their life. They, they're, they're playing maybe in the, their bass section at school or whatever, but they're interested. They think what you're doing is really cool, um, but they're terrified by the pro- like they you know the, the just the magnitude of what you're doing and all that you know that's a that's a path that that might be challenging. But what would be the first what like what would what advice might you give someone who wants to start exploring chamber music on the bass? No, that's a that's a really great question. Thanks for asking. I mean, I think. The first thing I would do, which is the first thing I did when I was in school, um, was just get together with your friends and and read some stuff totally, you know, for fun. Like maybe practice it before, but it doesn't have to be like first rehearsal ready because you have a concert on Saturday kind of thing. Um, just say like, hey, I found this piece I'm really excited about. Um do you want to play it? And, you know, it could be the Rossini duo, if so, you only have to get one person. Or you can get uh, Schulhoff trios, then you have uh, two other people. Or you can get, like, a whole Prokofiev quintet and just work on one movement. Um, also, if you're interested in repertoire outside of the, I guess, traditional canon of chamber music, which would be Trout, Dvorak, Prokofiev, and a few others, Um, there's a tremendous amount of stuff that has been written for the bass in the last hundred years. And there's an incredible resource um, that, uh, what's his name? Paul Namath, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'll link to that. 4,000 pieces. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) I use that all the time because I often have to put things together where it's like, okay, my friend and I are going to go into a school and we have to put something together. And my friend plays the clarinet. What is there for clarinet and bass? You go in, plug in clarinet and bass, and then you have all of these options. So then you can go through. They don't all have recordings, um, but you can go through and and check out what's there. Also, just if you're interested in chamber music, my favorite part about chamber music actually is individual players and how different people interpret their own lines. So going on Spotify or wherever you get your music, YouTube, there's plenty of stuff out there. Um, and just listening, finding recordings that you really, really, really like and figuring out what you really enjoy about what somebody's doing. It doesn't have to be a bass player, violinist, clarinet, whatever. And listening for what makes that person what makes them special and what is it that you really like about the way they're playing a certain piece and then think about what you can bring as a bass player with your own voice to the music that you're then going to maybe read with your friend or play in a concert eventually or something yeah wow I'm so thank you so much for taking some time to chat. I totally, I totally appreciate it. Um, I'm sure you're going to be up to many new things over the years. So anytime you got something new or like a new project or a new or, or anything, or you're teaching at a, at a summer festival or just, just, uh, I'd love to, I'd love to keep the conversation going. Oh, thank you so much, Jason.
Lizzie, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, check out links to everything we talked about in the show notes for this episode. And I really appreciate you following along. I know Lizzie appreciates it. And like I said at the outset, Probably a lot of what we talked about is up in the air, uh, certainly in terms of upcoming projects. I'm sure the same thing is for you listening, whether you are a performer or a teacher or music's your hobby or whatever. Uh, if you're like me, you're, you're locked in your house right now. Uh, here in San Francisco, it's pretty crazy. I, it's me and the police when I'm outside and I like, walk to the grocery store as fast as I can and come back. So it's harrowing times for sure. Hopefully, if you're listening to this a year from now, this all seems either overblown or in the past. Who knows how things will play out? I will try not to make that a major focus of the show here just because if you want to hear more about COVID-19, there are many other sources besides this podcast. But thank you for listening. Thank you for being with me, with us on this journey. Thank you to the team, Trevor Jones, Mitch Mooring, Krista Copper, Michael Cooper, and Steve Hinchy. And Mitch Mooring is out there in Kilgore, Texas, not too far from Dallas, Fort Worth, making beautiful bases. He's got this new shop running in downtown Kilgore. So my best to Mitch, to you listening, to folks everywhere. I'm Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 